So uh, it, doing these intros is always so awkward. It just feels so strange doing this kind of canned artificial, you know, so on <laughs> here, but, but, uh, uh, but uh, I am here with Daryl and this is our first, um, first one-on-one for the new s- series called uh, Daryl and the Wheel of Identification, which I don't know if you know, but there is a, a title to the series. I do now. <laughs> <laughs> do now. Um, so I've been looking forward to doing this and I think it's going to be so much fun to just work through everything. Um, I, I did put up the video, as you know, of, uh, the session, uh, from our group from the other day. And, um, there was, so there's a little bit of like, uh, people can see kind of how we've worked in the past a little bit from that. Um, but what I'd love is if you could just give a basic, you know, short potted bio, potted spiritual bio of how you got to where you are now and kind of the major highlights along the way and ups and downs. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this without um, letting this get long winded. So um, I got sober in AA in 2004 and I was fortunate that um, the person that I asked to sponsor me had inclinations towards Buddhism. And so he was a regular meditator and he all but insisted that I I start meditating every day for half an hour. And so I began meditating every day for half an hour. And it's interesting because the first time I actually sat down to meditate was um, I had no expectations. I mean, I I didn't even have any way of having any uh, sense of what might happen or so anyway, I sat down and I remember within the, you know, 10 minutes or so of, of, of sitting that um, my thoughts were happening out here. I was mm-hmm. watching thoughts go by and there was some degree of detachment and that was new. I'd never had that experience before. That's amazing. <clears throat> and so think, little things like that happened along the way that all kind of inf- seemed to inform uh, me about what this might be about. And sometimes I think that maybe these things were maybe previews about what things might look like down the line. So anyway, um, I was uh, a member of a Soto Zen group for a period of time. Um, uh, I guess it was around 2006 and then uh, did that for a while. My daughter was born and everything kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and then, uh, in 2014, I had, I don't know what you want to call it, a temporary awakening, awakening, Samadhi experience. Not sure. It's one that it, we talked about on, on the group meeting the other day, you know, the, <clears throat> you know, finding that these weren't my hands, these were just these hands and, you know, yeah. You're walking and the hand comes from, from the side and where did that come from? And voice open the mouth to say something to my daughter and there's this sound. It's not my voice. It has no ownership. It just comes out of the void. And all of that was really not shocking, but it, it really got my attention. It was really surprising. That's the word. It was incredibly surprising. <clears throat> and uh, then that has come up that kind of experience still comes up from time to time and it can last for a few hours, a few minutes. Um, and sometimes it's more intense than others. Mm-hmm. Then in 2019, I'd heard about the finders course, uh, but I figured it wasn't something I would ever get to do because of the price associated with it. Yeah. And then um, through, through means that aren't terribly important, I was given a shot at a scholarship and paying, uh, I think, 500 bucks for it. Wow. And so I, I happened to have the money. And so I jumped at it and I took the finder's course. The finder's course, um, you know, some people get really profound results in that three and a half, four months. I, I wouldn't say I got profound results, but I did notice towards the end of the finder's course that, um, funny little things started happening. Like it, it felt really uncomfortable to say I or me that, mm. that, that felt dishonest. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a sense that a very strong sense that there wasn't an I or a me, at least not the way that it had been thought of understood, you know, all the years prior. 
<clears throat> and uh, I noticed that the fear of death was dramatically reduced. Instead of thinking about death and feeling the air sucked out of my lungs uh, at the thought of it, now it was sometimes no reaction at all to sometimes, you know, some degree of disturbance, but nothing too intense. And so those, those two things really uh, made me sit up and pay attention. So, and I've taken the finders course uh, two other times since then over the last few years. And uh, I don't know that, well, they certainly weren't like the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, through all of this up until March, when I decided to take a break from it, I've had a sitting practice since 2004 when I got sober. And um, uh, the other thing about 2014 was that, and it's kind of what led to that experience um, that I, I've referred to twice now, um something happened it was it was fairly minor stuff you know we, were, we had moved and we were getting all these bills uh from the you know utilities and things from the place we'd lived before and uh, it really scared me it created a tremendous amount of anxiety and so one day when opening these bills and seeing them and having these fear reactions it suddenly hit me i, I didn't get sober to live like this i didn't get sober to be in fear I've got to do something. And, um, you know, well, what do I do? I didn't even know where to start. What do I do? And so I, I remembered there was a line in the big book about enlarging our spiritual life. Okay, well, all right, let's, let's take that as a, an idea. What does this mean, enlarge your spiritual life? And the only thing I had was my sitting practice. Mm -hmm. So instead of 45 minutes a day, now I was sitting twice a day for an hour. Mm -hmm and um, started listening to talks. If, first, it was all over the place. I didn't know who or what to listen to, whether it was Eckhart Tolle, which I'm not really truly a big fan of his. Um, but then I heard a talk by Tanisro Biku. That really grabbed me. That really grabbed me. There's something about that. I'm like, okay, this, this is what I'm looking for. That pulled me into Buddhism. Um, uh, I worked with as you know, Damarado for a period of, uh, I, don't know, I think four years anyway, and, um, started to get deeper into, into Buddhism finders course, fortunately kind of put that in perspective. So instead of getting a, um, you know, people can, can get into Buddhism or things, you know, Taoism or Indian, you know, Advaita or what have you. And, get a, a, a very strong set of beliefs <clears throat> and uh, um, that can, you know, as we know, that can become a filter for what, what you'll let in and what you won't let in in terms of ideas and what you'll do, what you won't do. And <clears throat> nothing wrong with it necessarily, but I was getting this very heavily Buddhist view of everything and the finders course, first of all, um, help to get rid of some myths and misconceptions that I had. Big one was, um, you hear it a lot, sadly, in, in um, a lot of Buddhism, especially here in the West, that awakening isn't even possible. Yeah. yeah. So even though I didn't think that was true, um, the finder's course helped completely wash that away and a lot of other, a lot of other things of that sort that really could be problematic and, and interfere with the process. So anyway, <clears throat> um, Finders course led to this. Um, somebody, uh, Patty, Patty Levin, um, uh, went through a pretty dark period last into the winter, beginning of spring, and uh, she had suggested the the Fetter work and had mentioned Pernilla by name, and so I jumped into uh, the the Fetter work, and it was interesting to see that the results were very profound in a very short space of time. I mean that that dark place very quickly um, just cleared away. Um, and so that's, that, that leads us to, to today. Um, yeah. at least in, in terms of trying to be, uh, as succinct as possible. Yeah, I know. That's amazing. That was, those are really, really well done summation. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so I guess from now we'll just kind of take it up as though, you know, it's just, jumping in right after the last session. So, um, you know, we might go back and for people who are watching this, who haven't been in all of our meetings before this, you know, we can always, uh, um, clarify some things, but other than that, um, what's been going on since I know it's only been a few days since the last session. Um, but what's been going on since then? 
Um, not a great deal. Trying to remember to um, stop when there when something happens that provokes um, an intention and the idea that I'm doing something, um, <clears throat> which for me the way it typically goes is a practice like that will be suggested, and I may write it down. Uh, I may not, but whatever the case is, is there is something that's holding on to the idea and working to try to remember to put it in practice. And what will happen is it'll get forgotten a lot and then something will happen and I'll remember, oh, there was my opportunity. But I don't I don't beat myself up because I, I now I understand that's part of the process of learning to do it. That's that's the first stage. Like, you have to forget a lot and remember that you've forgotten. And then what happens is you start remembering. And then once you start remembering, then it gradually some, for me, usually very slowly will build up um, or increase in terms of how frequently it's remembered. Yeah. Uh, I always like in all of this, the, the, anything that, that any kind of practice or something that, that I'm doing is with, I always liken it to sati because I'm trying to cultivate sati. It was always a case of remembering to be mindful, you know, and what I learned as well, it takes time and you have to forget a lot. <laughs> I really do. Yeah. I yeah. Love I can't remember them all right now, but like Shinzen Young has that series of robots that he talks about. Like there's like the bad <laughs> robot that is your automatic, like, and I might get this a little bit wrong. So don't, <laughs> don't get too hung that's up. That's new to me. I hadn't heard this. So yeah, it's like, it's like the bad robot is the one that's like, you know, addicted to heroin and, you know, <laughs> alcoholic and all that sort of thing. And then you have the, is it the, the like, neutral robot that, that is like, you know, it kind of remembers, like it wants to do the right thing. And then it's like the the good robot is where you're you're actually, when you're like actually sitting on the mat and you're actually doing the inquiries and that sort of thing. And then it's the, it's the automatic robot or something where it just becomes like a pattern. And and it basically in in short, the, the idea is that you have um, uh, these different habit patterns that are on. And so it, it takes exactly what you said, where sometimes you, you, you have like the intention of, doing these exercises but you're not really doing them yet because it's not part of the system and then the more you have that sort of thought about doing the thing and then occasionally do it the more it becomes part of the the habit pattern until eventually that becomes your you're you're just like you're like you're you've had a seated meditation practice since 2004 you know that it's like that sort of thing where it takes a little while to develop and then it just becomes like, this is just the thing that I do every day. And that just becomes the robot that just runs completely on its own. And it feels weird to then not sit and have a practice. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So you're absolutely right. It just takes, it, it takes allowing these things to, to just become part of your daily routine and part of the, the, the first thought that comes up that, uh, right. This is an opportunity to inquire and not that, oh crap, I just missed the opportunity to inquire, but that's how you get there. Well, and <clears throat> there was a time not all that long ago that when I would forget, um, I would admonish myself to some degree or another. And, and now I don't do that anymore. I don't, I don't give myself a hard time at all because now I, I can see it clearly. That is the first step in the process. You have to forget a lot then you, re you start to remember and gradually you remember more and more. So, and, um, you know, I might not ever do these things as frequently as I want to. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, but it, it's something that um, maybe, maybe desire might um, increase the frequency. I don't know. But, uh, you know, however often happens, it happens. I mean, the affirmations um, still don't happen with a great deal of frequency most of the time. But that's OK, because that it happens at all is really great, because even the little bit that it happens in a given, you know, in a, in, in a period of a day has already started to yield fruit. That's amazing. Uh, and for anybody who's watching this, who, you know, because I, I don't think we really talked about them, except that you just briefly mentioned affirmations in the last uh, last thing. So so you've been doing which ones have you been doing um, when you remember to do it? Have uh, hang on. I know it's going to seem silly because yeah, you think right. I now, but it's okay. for some reason, um, I'm not recalling them clear left off. Oh, OK. Uh, I am worthy of being here exactly as I am. And I love myself exactly as I am. And so um, for anybody watching also, 
you know, when we do those to sort of counteract all of those years of having um, been negatively biased towards ourselves that, that we're, we're constantly putting ourselves down and creating these negative stories that just become so habit bound that we have to sort of on this level of speaking consciously uh, re brainwash or re, you know, reformulate and send it the other direction to kind of counteract all of those, all of those, um, those old habits of, of negativity. Um, but do you find that, so when, when you're actually doing them, that you have enough of a benefit from doing it, that it's then like, at least, even though it's not frequent, that, that it gives you that little incentive when you do remember to do it, that you have gotten something out of it and makes it more palatable? Well, the issue of pal being palatable very quickly disappeared. Um, but as far as creating that sort of reinforcing feedback loop, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not something that is, um, just really clearly obvious, but yeah, you can tell it's there. The, the two things I want to also get to with that is, um, one, sometimes that, that kind of forgetting to do it is itself a very subtle form of resistance to it. Because I know when yeah, you, you mentioned that, yeah, because when you first started, it was like clear resistance to doing it. And it might be that it's now mutated and, you know, it's softened up a bit that it's not like this hardcore contraction against, you know, saying I love myself exactly as I am. Now it's just this, oh, I think I'm going to forget about that for a while. <laughs> Maybe I'll just, you know, conveniently forget that that was my practice and go do something else. Well, here's the twist on that, yeah. is that you had suggested to not just simply say them by rote, which is the huge difference. That's the huge difference, because in actually taking the time to feel some love and compassion towards myself, that's way different than a very Stuart Smalley sort of just repeating them and hoping that it takes somehow. That and, and to be able to actually feel some compassion and love um, towards myself um that really that really completely uh it, it makes it something else entirely you know and and of course that also plays into the self-reinforcing feedback loop because you know here here you are for the first time well not the first time well here's something that has, has had been uh, generally um infrequent and certainly never came from it was never sourced from inside. Mm -hmm. It was something that was always found from other people. Yeah. No, and that tends to be problematic. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, were you were you able to find if you were trying to source this kind of love and acceptance and things from other people? Was it? Um, did you find that it worked? you know, other than maybe having a, a quick hit of, of dopamine or something, was it? In, in one way or another, and of course, uh, you know, the, the, the one way or another is too many variables across too many people across too many years to be able to even talk about that, at least not within a, a minute or two. Um, it, it was unreliable. I mean, even with somebody who had the best of intentions the 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 you know the best souls I've ever I've ever come across who cared about me it, it's just unreliable and even if it wasn't on their end it's you know something there are things that happen internally that well for me I'll I'll say this I don't know what it's like for other people but for myself because of the fact that I got those messages so much from my mom um, for all the years I lived at home you know as a kid and a teen that um, it's really hard to accept from other people. You know, I've had a few people in my life, still in my life, who who love me very deeply. And regardless of whatever they've done that might cause me to interpret that differently, well, maybe they don't really or whatever, or see your mom was right, any of that stuff. Um, it doesn't, um, um, lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, you haven't, you, you, you it, the other people can't give that to you. That yeah. It's that it's, you don't fundamentally believe. And so then yeah. showering it upon you is still it's running up it up to that to that 
old brainwashing that you had of not being worthy for it and you know all the things that your mom said that right that's yeah. exactly right yeah so even even with people who have the best of intentions and the most reliable people it it still is unreliable because of what's happening in here yeah yeah so. generally speaking well actually yeah <laughs> i still wanted to go back to the other thing but on this train um okay generally speaking uh do you find that your your overall daily feeling of of self-worth has changed in some way it's beginning to it's not something that i would say is um really obvious in a very clear distinct sort of way <clears throat> but as like i mentioned on uh, tuesday there are, and it's happened again since the meeting on tuesday there are, there are things that will happen that will set off that voice uh that it that internal voice of, of, um, you know, you're no good or, um, you know, things of that nature, you know, just berating yourself. And now that when those, when those things happen, there's a sense of, you know, that's not really true. Don't, don't, that's not really true. And don't listen to that. And, and just something it has shifted at least enough that now that's no longer accepted. You know, it comes up, it's heard. But now it's, you know, after a moment, it's recognized not true and you don't have to listen to it and it's dismissed. I love that. It's like you have that, that internal, you know, father figure or older brother figure that it's like, oh, no, buddy, it's okay. You know, it's, it's not true. <laughs> listen to them, you know, it, they're just jerks. You know, it's like, <laughs> I love the way, they, the way that you say that. It's like this really nice, you know, I got your back. It's okay. You don't have to listen to them. Well, it's funny. I had never thought of it like that until you said it that way. So that's really kind of a um, that's that's kind of a cool way to to view it. It's very nice because it is. It's this, you know. It's it's you being the the bigger, wiser, more protective self of this, you know, little Daryl who didn't know better than to believe everything that he'd been told and to take it on that there was really something insufficient about him. It's really something not worthy. And now you can see that that's not true. And that's for a variety of reasons. I mean, the, the one that's, that is true, but that leads to bypassing, unfortunately, is that, of course, there's no Daryl there who was, you know, ever wrong and who is now. But the problem is, if we just go right to that level, it really is where we get a lot of people who bypass um, all of the emotional stuff. And so it never really gets met until it comes out in dark night of the soul ways or, you know, mm. really like you start to realize, oh, now I need therapy, you know, like, like I've seen it myself, but there's still something really, really wrong. And it's because we're, we're using that, that no self thing to just bypass the real, the real trauma that's underneath it that just needs to be seen and healed. So, yeah, well, that's what's been great about this is is finding that out. Because left to my own devices, I probably would, and nothing, not a criticism of Buddhism, but you know, a lot of the way it's presented and taught, not all of it, but it, it, it is really common to hear people suggest things where, like you said, you get bypassed, there is no self. Yeah. Um, it's it's a double edged sword. Um, and back when I had all my anxiety and all the all that stuff, it was the no self thing that really helped to unbind that um, the anxiety and all the self, uh, you know, the the self focused uh, stuff that was the problem of it. And it can be really good for depression and lots of things. But if you have this fundamental starting point that you are in some way shameful or insufficient or not good enough or always wrong or something like that the 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 way that you're viewing the world is always through that lens and so even knowing that there is no self it doesn't change that process that's going through that lens because the the what we don't really talk about which just it's kind of crazy that we don't is you're not getting rid of a self, right? There was never a self. We talked about the, that in the last one, that there was a Daryl-less Daryl, and now there's still a Daryl-less Daryl, right? There never was a self. But back when there wasn't a self, when Daryl was a child, there was 
guilt and, you know, feelings of unworthiness and all of that. There wasn't a self there. And yet those feelings of, of shame, guilt, fear, all of those things can still exist. Right. There's still no Daryl now. There's still no self now, but those things can still show up because they are not dependent upon a self to exist. Wow. I had never made that connection before. That's, <laughs> that's a really good piece of information to be aware of. Yeah. So the whole idea of get, of using the no self to get rid of this fundamental processing that happens of seeing the world through either rose colored glasses where everything is super awesome and everything turns out right and it all goes my way or I am a lump of shit and everything I do is terrible and everybody hates me and all that. They're just different. Neither of them are true. Both of them are just filters through which experience is being experienced. You know, the world is being seen through this, this particular filter and that has nothing to do with the self being there or not. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> the identification of it, which is the, that feeling of, I am the luckiest person in the world and everything goes my way, or I am terrible and I ruin everything I touch. Those cycles of identification that happen are something which can get rooted out. But the actual, the actual hmm. thought, the actual uh, sort of subconscious um, tone, like the feeling tone, the Vedana behind experience is something which is independent of there being a self because it's been happening the entire time that you've been alive and there has never been a self there at any point. <laughs> it's interesting that I've never heard anyone point that out, but that's a, uh, that's obviously pretty, at, at the very least really helpful to know, but probably really important. I, 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 think, <clears throat> I think it is. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why we're not we're not more aware of the fact that you know, okay. Yeah, it's just I was wondering what what my dog was doing over here. Was destroying the bed, okay. <laughs> not really, but I don't know if that's gonna come come across on the camera or not, but if anyone's wondering, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, see, I can hear it, but I can't see what's actually actually happening. Okay. Let it stop. I wonder if she's comfortable yet. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. Okay, let the scratching continue. So anyway, there's, there's, there's a. So it shows that this, this um, feeling of of, uh, of striving and and desiring is not just a human thing. You know, uh, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Oh, no. <laughs> um. Yeah, but but that's the thing is, you know, we we talk about it on one hand, we always say that there's no self, but on the other hand, we talk about it as though this process is actually eliminating something that has been there. And it's a weird a weird uh contradiction in the way that that we really can con con um conceptualize it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that seems like it should be obvious hearing you say it, but I have to admit that that up until sometime recently, that's that's really been the the idea or the sense is that something is being gotten rid of or dropped or or something will fall away, which mm -hmm. you know. So there's something there. There's a presence of something, and we're looking for its absence, but. That's actually not the case. Not really. You know, <clears throat> it's crazy because there are every way that we discuss these things, we're we're invoking some new concept, some new way of looking at something. And sometimes they cause more problems than they solve. But if you have the idea that, you know, I might use the phrase that there's a, a shift in perception, which in itself is not unproblematic because it involves the idea that there is a perceiver who is perceiving and all of that. There's like no clean way to talk about it without invoking some sort of duality. Right. But the idea that 
instead of it being that I am dropping something, there's nothing there to be dropped and there's no one there who can drop it. There's, there is the idea of getting rid of something. If we were going to say that that was true, the only thing I could really say is that we're getting rid of the, um, and, and again, I don't like the we're getting rid of part, but what's changing is that there aren't, there isn't the belief in the cycle of, of um, uh, self-involved thoughts, basically. And, and that being like the first fetter thing. And then as the later fetters go, it's the assumptions of what is being seen and heard and experienced that all gradually can be seen through and fall away. Okay. But it's just a different pattern of, of behavior that's happening. And it's really helpful to take the eye out of that whole equation because it's a very insidious little hidden eye. Hmm. Yeah, you say it's a, a very insidious hidden eye. Be specific about that if you don't oh. mind. Oh, what, what exactly. Are you... Okay. There's, there's an implication that there is an eye who is dropping something and becoming lighter and more open. That there is someone who is doing the practice to get something better out of it. That I am, you know, uh, on the sixth fetter now, whereas I was, or I haven't seen through the first fetter yet. Or, But it's just a process of experiences that's happening. You have the good robot, the bad robot. You have the, um, you know sensations and you have thoughts and all that and this particular configuration of thoughts and sensations is what we are calling the identified miserable depressive self and then you have a different variation of physical sensations and thoughts and we're calling this one the awake enlightened open you know vibrating with everything self but there is no consistency in any of that and there's no one being who has joined those two states. It's just patterns of behavior and patterns of of, of uh, experience. Yeah. Yeah, but, that, that makes sense. I see. I can see that. But we talk about it in a way that very subtly not only reinforces that sense of some sort of eye underneath it but it actually also gives you that um that feeling of of having to strive for something so you get you get this and and it's funny how it is right so you have thoughts about you you have a thought and you have a sensation that say something is wrong here you get some information that says well if you do this kind of practice you will feel better. So then you take in this information or the information is brought in, it's assimilated. You then have this, you know, feeling of now I have to do that thing, but it's just another version of physical sensations and thoughts appearing in space that have a new tone to it. And this new tone is, oh, I have to do something. I have to strive for this thing. This is a thing which is going to make me feel better. Because there's a belief that if I do that, I, this thing which is consistent, is going to be a new, enlightened, lovely state. But it's just not like that. There's that 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 current or thread that goes between all of the the unenlightened state, the striving state, and the enlightened state. There is no consistent being who joins those three. They're independent experiences. And they don't necessarily happen linearly only in one direction. As you know, you had your playground experience, right? And then you had multiple right. experiences afterwards. It wasn't a linear process that there's no Daryl, then there's, but the, but the, I, the identified no Daryl, then there's the really open and expansive unidentified no Daryl, and then that's it. It goes back and forth, back and forth until it becomes more of your way of sort of the default state of, of that, you know, body-mind complex 
is okay. is vibrating or doing that process. It's that automatically good robot that just is the one that's that's running most of the time. But it doesn't indicate anything about you who has done those things or you who has experienced it and then fallen off and, you know, now it only experiences it occasionally and all of that. Well, you answered a question before I could even ask it, so that was good to know because I was I was wondering about you know because I know people who you know it's and some of them have, have it's a very deep experience that is now persistent. It's been this way for for years. So you answered that. The thing that's kind of curious in all of that is I, I'm assuming this is true for everyone else. For me, it was a desire to get away from painful experience, yeah. and um, so if if there's something seeking to end suffering what is it that's ending the this what is it that's seeking the ending of suffering it's a really good question yeah because i mean clearly you know it doesn't take much to turn the attention back here and look and see there's there's not you know there's not somebody sitting behind the eyes there's not some sort of soul or or some kind of central agent yeah. um so, you know, considering that question, it's it's really kind of mysterious because I can't find an answer to it. <laughs> you know, it just seems like, you know, something doesn't want to suffer. And it seems that the desire not to suffer is kind of its own thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on, well, okay. So if you were sitting there and you had a physical pain in your leg or some part of your body it's possible to sit there and just experience the sensation in a way which keeps it from going from suffering it, it changes it from suffering which is really our resistance to it right right so we go from <clears throat> suffering down to just sensation and potentially equanimity with whatever's there so the suffering element doesn't need to be there and that's not that's not um wholly a part of any experience but what you're asking is what is it that feels that motivation to not suffer right so if we if we go into it um i wonder if we could do like a little a little exploration but do you have anything right now that, that where you feel that sense of of striving away from suffering hmm It's funny, my back and hip have been bothering me on and off for about a week. And <laughs> here's, an, here, here's an opportunity to put it to use and it doesn't seem to be an issue. So okay. I, I can't really, I can't seem to find anything now. You have a needle you want to stick into your hand or something? <laughs> well, sure, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I can always just do something as simple as um, press a fingernail into the end of, uh, of my thumb. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to actually have you inflict okay. pain upon yourself, but um, but no, no, the the thing is that you have there's there's the idea that there is something there which is trying to push against suffering is partly an innate response. It's just a, an animal response to to get away from pain and stop it from happening, but we take it that there is some resistance there which is causing that and it depends on case by case sort of what the suffering is which gives us our impetus out of it for most of us who do this kind of thing we were suffering you know with some either depression anxiety feelings of you know low self-worth or something like that so we have that experience and then you you well you know we try anything that we can to kind of numb it um, either, you know, through drugs and alcohol or finding out about meditation or something else. But I, I would say if we look for what is there, I think there's a, it's not so much that there is a thing there, which is pushing against it. It's a resistance that's happening in the moment to the way things are appearing. So if you were having pain in your back right now, 
there would most likely be a resistance to that pain, which is what we call suffering. And your urge to get away from that is the, the um, resistance to experiencing what is happening right now. And that might go in the sense of, well, now I'm going to go and get a drink. Now I'm going to go and take a, a you know, a, a painkiller. Now I'm going to go and uh, go see some sort of chiropractor or something. You know, whatever the uh, route that takes in order to try to get out of that suffering is not really relevant to um, to what you're asking. What it is, is that it's the resistance itself, which is like a fifth fetter aversion thing that is priming that whole push to seek and to do something to get away from what's here, to get some sort of relief from what's here, whether it is a depressive suffering or a physical pain suffering or, um, you know, anything else that, that life throws at us. It's that the resistance to it and that resistance is being created by all of this kind of past um uh past beliefs of why things can't be the way they are and why it's bad that they are the way that they are hmm. <laughs> huh. yeah no i see it i see it i just once again one of those things that seems obvious when you say it but hadn't been prior to just now amazing amazing so um that's why with four and five we really are working with what is it that is causing the resistance to whatever the situation is why is whatever is happening here now not okay and then that's where the equanimity comes in once you recognize that anything that happens is okay because it is the way that it's happening and that's the only way it can be you can have that contentment and the equanimity to anything that's there, whether it is what we call physical pain or anything else. And that, so that striving doesn't have to happen. And that striving to get away from the suffering isn't indicative of some sort of entity that is doing it. Right. It's just something that's hardwired in. Yeah. Yeah. It's just resistance to, to pain and discomfort. Um, and it, you know, notice it's it's not it's not universal in every situation for everybody. So some people very much enjoy physical pain. So for them, they don't have that kind of aversive response to it. Some people pay other people to inflict pain upon them, right? right. We're, we're a very diverse species. We have we have a lot of people that that enjoy things that other people really would would uh, be terrified to to experience, and vice versa. Um, I'm very happy with a bowl of kale for dinner. Many people would not find that, would not, <laughs> not find that enjoyable to them, right. kind of, uh, turn out to torture. So it really depends on, on the, the background, the history, the operation of that particular body, mind organism. Well, and, and, and that being the case, you know, some people enjoying pain, that kind of thing. Yet the one thing we all do have in common, and I think all living things have this, is to get away from anything that causes suffering, however we interpret and understand what suffering is. Exactly. Yeah, the person who pays somebody else to inflict pain upon them, um, you know, they they might suffer having to watch a rom-com and they would do everything they can to, you know, get out of that room instead of watching a, <laughs> that movie. You know, we, we don't know what it is for every person, but you're right. There is something, whatever it is that's in them, that finds a, a, a resistance to that. And, and, it's, and it's because there, a romantic comedy for some people would cause them physical irritation. You know, there's something that it brings up old memories, old biases, a whole bunch of thoughts about a certain situation and that causes this inner turmoil that makes that an unbearable thing. Right. And good example. I I've always hated eighties music and like, like eighties <laughs> pop music. And uh -huh. it, to the point where it used to do something to me physically, like I would feel physically like uneasy listening to eighties pop music. It was something to do with the sound of the drums, the synthesizers, the, like the reverb they used, like, 
all these different things would would add together and i would feel like physically uneasy listening to 80s pop music so i have a friend who loves it and when i was doing four and five fetter work i was like can you send me the most stereotypically 80s 80s music that you could and then i put it on and i would sit with these different songs and i would just feel what happened in the body and be like why am i resisting this what you know what and there were some memories that popped up of like you know being a child in the 80s with my mom dragging me around a grocery store for you know two hours at a time with the 80s music playing and just other things <laughs> that were like like such things, but i hated it at the time and I, I still don't know if that's really the root of it but there were things that like were associated with those songs with those sounds and so i was able to just sit with it and um you know, be with the sensations of discomfort listening to 80s music. And it really, it really helped. Like, I, I still don't enjoy it. Like, it's not my favorite genre of music, but I can listen to it without pain now. So that's wonderful. And it's interesting that it works that way, because I, I did something similar. I was um, spending a lot of time with my older sister, and she listens to a lot of stuff that just kind of like what you were saying sets me off. Yeah. And I, I, you know, had had the suggested, the practice suggested to me uh, at some time in the past with those sorts of things to actually take the discomfort and get into it and investigate it and, and work with the, the un, seeming unpleasantness of the experience mm -hmm. and was kind of surprised when I did get to the other side of it and got to a point where none of that stuff bothered me anymore. I mean, it still doesn't. And I, I guess there had been some sort of unconscious sense that that kind of stuff really isn't something that is um, very easily dropped or, or let go of. There's the idea that everything that we <clears throat> have as a bias or as a like or a don't like or something is just hardwired in. And if you look through your experience through your life, most likely you have gone back and forth on things and, you know, really loved something and then absolutely, excuse me, hated it and then loved something else and hated that. And we just, we have this false sense of narrative that really feels like well, however we are now has always been that way. And we, we <laughs> tend to forget all the ways in which it differed. I mean, I don't personally, and a lot of people attest to this, like I went, I went vegetarian when I was 27 and vegan when I was 29. And shortly after that, it became, even though I ate meat for the first 27 years of my life, it seemed like I've never eaten meat. Like it seemed like this weird thing happened where it just seemed so incongruent with current experience that I can't picture me ever doing that. And yet I know that it happened for 27 years. And yet... <laughs> It, it just feels completely like this completely different life. It's like watching a movie of somebody eating it and going, well, that wasn't me, you know, like the, the perception, like, no, no, I've always been like this, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a very absurd trick that we play or that the mind plays. Huh? Well, you're right about the fact that these things vary over time, but I, I I've never noticed that one in myself where it seems like, or there's this idea or, or belief that it's always been like this. So I'll, ha I'll have to look for, I'll have to see if I can find some of those within myself. Yeah. Yeah. This probably I, I, yeah, I would think so. That, that's why, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine how that's unique, first of all, to you, let alone, you know, unique to say a small segment of the population. Yeah. I, that sounds like something that's probably a pretty common trait. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. But, why would it come up? You know, why, why would we doubt it? Like, unless something, unless you're in a situation where somebody knew you from childhood and then you're arguing some political point and they're like, and you're saying, you know, I've always been, you know, a Democrat. And they're like, no, you weren't, you know, like there was something like, I remember when you said, no, I didn't, you know, like, like unless somebody else has this very different view of you or you read something that you wrote back then, or, you know, went back to old journals or something. We're like, Oh, I didn't remember saying that or thinking that. That's a great idea. Cause I have, I have all my journals going back to high school. Dude, boy, that would be a fascinating. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've been thinking for a, a very long time. Oh, I ought to pull those out and go through those. And I've just never have gone through with it, but 
now there's a real motivation in light of this conversation because now I wonder what's lurking there. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating, and and I think the 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 caveat would be to make sure that, that it doesn't create more feelings of self of like oh I remember when I was like that and you know because it can it can work both ways you can use it as a tool to see all the things that you have forgotten and how things have changed and you can see that as the instability of self right or you can use it in that way of like oh I was so funny back then or you know I was so whatever right. and then use that to reinforce the sense of of remembering being the likable person that you were back then, you know, that sort of thing. Or, yeah, I remember I was so talented in those days, whatever, whatever <laughs> it was, you know, or, or the negatives of, you know, oh, I, you know, you know, whatever the, the, the issues were back in those days, noticing the, the strain of thought where it goes from you know, oh, I was like that then, and I still feel that now. Or I, you know, noticed that kind of those threads that are being pulled there in order to create that sense of of consistency across time. That's the one I was thinking would have, that seemed like it would be most problematic is anything that's consistent. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting to note, though, because that's going to give you an even better indication now of what you need to look into. What is there that is causing any sort of issues? Um, mm. You know, because those are the filters that have been so strongly uh, in in force, or you know, they have been working so intently. Those are the ones that are the most solidified. If you felt something back in high school and you still feel that same way now, that yeah. filter has been you know kind of rusted in place this whole time. That's that's uh, the yeah. point that you're looking through. Um, whereas <clears throat> Democrat, Republican, vegetarian, omnivore, whatever the things are as they change, or, you know, liking this style of music, not liking that one, those are really can be fleeting and, and you know, much more loose and, and flowing. But if you have something that has been a consistent, then that's really coloring your ex existence now just as much as it was then. Well, now I have a real motivation to do this, so... Yeah. Yeah, it could be fascinating. <laughs> okay. That's amazing. Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to have to do that then because uh, if nothing else, it's made me too darn curious. <laughs> Absolutely. So have you looked into the whole intention thing anymore? Yeah, I have. I'm, I mean, it's happened a few times. There have been a, a, a few times when something will happen and and then there's the impulse to get up or move or, you know, to go and do something. Um, and the few times I've remembered so far, um, the one thing that I forgot to do, and I, I remembered it just earlier today, this morning, actually, is to look at that, to, to delay getting up or, or moving, mm -hmm. and then to look at the tension or contraction or discomfort that 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 creates. I kind of lost track of that. So, yeah. but yeah, it, there, there have been a few times since Tuesday where that has come up and, um, it's like, it, it, it's like a lot of things regarding this. And I guess first fetter, um, uh, first fetter, uh, related things. <clears throat> One moment. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, <laughs> there was a loophole an opportunity there. <laughs> I was just going to say that was your opportunity. That yeah, was a perfect opportunity. Just as you were going, oh, oh I, it, it, same thing hit me. <laughs> oh darn it! <clears throat> um, but uh, it, it's kind of like when something happens and looking for the self in it. it, it it's not. It's not frustration. There's, I don't know, there, there's this kind of tension or something that comes up when looking for it because you go looking for it and it very clearly is not there. Yeah. And so I guess, it, I guess the tension is, is created in regard to feeling like if I could just dig more deeply or could um, look more... Um, 
look more thoroughly, you know, as if there's something that has been overlooked or something that is somehow missed or, or hidden that hasn't been found. And, and like, I'm not looking hard enough. And it's not that I think I'm going to find a self. It's just, uh, it, uh, there's this idea about being able to make sure that I'm really digging deeply enough. Mm. And, you know, I, I don't really, I mean, I know that's not the case. I mean, cause there's really nowhere else to look. There's, there's only so much looking that you can do and only, I mean, it's all kind of here, yeah. you know? Absolutely. <clears throat> so, um, it's the same thing with this exercise. There's, you know, um, something will happen and there's the, the impulse to move. And so it's a question of, okay, so how's this happening? Where's the impulse coming from? Yep. Who is it that wants to, who is it that wants to move? And of course it's, I can't find, I can't find that. I don't have an answer. There's, I mean, all, all I can see, for instance, um, I can't think of a particular example, but um, something will happen and, you know, the impulse to move. And so I'm looking for, where, well, where's the intention coming from? Well, the intention's coming from somebody said something. And so I, I, I needed to respond. Um, well, okay, so you're you're starting, you know, you're feeling like getting up, you're you're starting to move, or you're about to move. Where's that coming from? Well, that's just that's just the mind putting the body in action in response to a, something that's conditioned. You you heard somebody saying they needed help, and so that's a conditioned response. I mean, th those are the only kinds of answers that have I've, I've been able to come up with, and. and Kind of like what I was saying a minute ago, there's always a sense that there's something more. I'm overlooking something. I, th I think but, you're right because I, because I <clears> agree, <throat> and and I, you know, what you've what you've said is all spot on. Um, <clears throat> not looking for a conceptualizable, verbal verbalizable answer. So when we're looking for it, you're right. There probably is a conditioned response. However. In the moment, in direct experience, you don't even know that you have a brain, no less a brain that's capable of conditioned responses, right? That's a bit of learned information. I see. Uh, okay. So in the moment, when we're doing these inquiries, we are only looking for something visible or physical or sensible in direct experience. So if you have to go to any sort of concept to explain it, then you're right. You haven't gotten down to what we're looking for yet. Okay. So, well, I think, I think that, that addresses the, that, that tension that's created that sense of something being overlooked. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very convincing and it's, you know, quite likely true, but it's not going to help you see through it. That's just going to convince you, um, uh, cognitively. So, Say that again. It's not going to you, about it, about convincing you cognitively. Yeah, it's gonna like doing that sort of thing. Like, oh, it's you know, it's just a conditioned response. It's my brain wanting to do something, and then it's you know, mobilizing muscles in the body and all that. That's very cerebral, and it might convince you on a on a on a logical cerebral level where you can explain how the sun doesn't you know, go around the earth, but vice versa and all that, like, that's all great. But in your direct experience, that's where the sort of internal sense of not knowing, like the way that we talk about knowing, but knowing in the sense of experiencing happens. And then that's where that conviction comes from. Like when you were on the playground and you had that opening, you didn't know that you were having that opening in the way like you didn't try to rationalize it and conceptualize it and say oh and now no. there's space right it's no. just the experience right <clears throat> when we're talking about doing this kind of inquiry too it's looking for that kind of experience that is indefinable unexplainable but absolutely palpable and convincing on a way that's not just cerebral it's like oh, 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 back in your chair, back oh. in your chair. 
<laughs> it's funny because I've been feeling the tension. I've been feeling the tension for you know a few minutes here, listening to this whining and groaning at the door. Okay, well, it, even... interrupt me now. All right, so so <laughs> so you want to go open that door, right? Right. Right. So f- I want you to feel into the body, and what feels like there is an intention to get up and move to that door. And again, we're, we're not trying to use any oh. sort of learning that you have had about how the body works we want to investigate your direct experience so come first i'd say into the physical body and okay. feel what the muscles are doing feel if there's like an energetic quote unquote energetic pull a feel of muscular tension someplace of a sort of a magnetic sense that, that you can feel what are you well what, there's... <clears throat> i'm sorry go ahead you know i was asking what are you experiencing um, just in terms of physical, uh, yeah. it's yeah, just physical. kind of a, a contraction through here, Good. through the face, neck, chest, torso, and then to a, a much lesser extent as you go out into the rest of the body. It seems like most of it's centered here. And, and yeah, it, it, it is kind of a, um, it's not like a full on muscle contraction the way you think of a muscle contraction, but it is a, a physical sense of tightness. Yeah. Really good. Excellent. And close your eyes again. Okay. Feel that, get that idea that you really want to go to the door and you have this intention of just, okay, I got to get up. I got to open the door. What is happening alongside of the physical sensations in the body that these contraction-y feelings that you're feeling, what's going on in the thought space? Um, <clears throat> huh. Um, the sound he's making is distracting, hard to keep the attention on what's being said. Um, uh, he's liable to start chewing on the door. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, uh, wish that would stop. Um, uh, I can't remember what else. That's all right. And what do those thoughts do to your body? Do you notice a, a connection? Yeah, it it reinforces that that sense of tightness. Good. Excellent. So going between the sensations about him chewing up the door and can't concentrate and got to just go open the door and let the dog in and then feeling that contraction in the body, where is the sense that there is a you who is able to put an action into motion and actually go open that door? Where is the sense that there is a you to do yeah, that? That can do that. Um, I guess it's here. Hey, good. Can we get more specific? Um, I guess it would really be the head. Possibly, I, I don't want to say it's the face. I think it's more than that. Mm-hmm. I think it's. I think it really is just kind of the general head area. Good. So feel the face. (coughs) What about it? What about the face feels like it is related to this sense of self who is able to, to perform this action. Say that again. Yeah. What is it about the feeling of the face or what is it about the sense of the face that seems like that is something that could help perform this action? I guess because it seems like this is sort of, (laughs) <laughs> the central processing unit, you know, mm-hmm. this is where everything is seen and heard and where thought is happening or seems to. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. And, you know, it's curious hearing her whine, yeah. um, that reaction, there's, when there's the experience of Vedna, like mm-hmm. in this case, the unpleasant feeling, um, it's that, that tone, that feeling tone, I would have to describe it as a mental feeling tone. Mm. It, it's noticed here. And so that also seems to be part of it. Mental feeling. Tone. Okay. So how is that showing up that mental feeling tone? Because would you say it's, it's in the physical um, uh, imaginary sense? Like, like we have, like we have, you know, the five physical emotion or emotions, five physical sense faculties 
But then we also have the five sort of internal mental <clears throat> versions of those same sense faculties. Uh, it's more, yeah, I wouldn't say it's really purely physical. It, it's, it seems it's more, gosh, kind of hard to talk about, um, hard to, to describe. It seems like it's a, it's weird because it, it, it's happening. It seems to be happening inside the head. Mm. And it seems like if somebody said, describe it, I'd have to say it, it seems like kind of a tightness, but there's nothing there to really be tight. <laughs> I, mean, mm -hmm. there, I mean, there are muscles on the outside, but maybe that maybe it is being felt in the muscles and it just seems like it's all through the head because that's where it's happening. I don't know. That's really difficult to pin down. Notice the, the muscles in the face. Notice the, the muscles that, that are creating the sense of emotion in the face or the, the, the externalization of the emotion in the face. So the expressions that we take, you know, if you're scowling, we can generalize and know approximately what you're feeling based on that scowl. Okay. So, so can you feel that and how that feeds in the, the, the expression on your face, how that muscle tension and the placement of the eyes and the tension around the eyes and the jaw and all that stuff is feeding into that, making that, that emotion or that thought about it seem more real. Huh. Just when I need one of them to make some noise. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I can see what you're getting at. It seems to give the, the what's going on in the face seems to give the, the mental aspect of it or mental component seems to give it some substance. Exactly. Yeah, it's a constant feedback loop of a thought, a physical sensation that is considered to be related to that thought, but it gives exactly as you said, that thought a sense of physical substance and reality. Because we know a thought can't open a door. Right. But if there's an idea that that thought can connect with the physical body in a way in which that physical body can open a door, it seems much more plausible that there could be a sense of doing happening. Do you mind repeating that? Not at all. So if you have an, a, a mental thought, a mental image of something which can't physically open a door, but it can be uh, connected with a feeling of a physical body. So it, it's giving a feedback to some sort of physical, um, you know, physicality in the face, in the chest, in the stomach. <clears throat> it gives the sense that there is a physical body there that can somehow act on behalf of these thoughts. It reinforces that sense that maybe there is really somebody there who can actually get up and open a door. So it, it sounds like what, what's being implied there is that there's this mental component that's happening in response to what's happening over there mm -hmm. and that connects to the body by way of tightness and other sensation in the face mm -hmm. and the other parts of the body but yes well it seems like it starts well i could be wrong I, I'll, I'll wait and no, investigate no, no. It myself but it seemed it, first blush it seemed like that's where it starts it, it gets its foothold here yeah yeah and and i think that's hugely hugely likely um but definitely huh. investigate, see if you're missing something else. But that in itself is such a big factor. There's so much um, connection to what we take to be ourselves is because of this mask of a face and all of the, the permutations that it goes through that connect to all of these myriad thoughts that are constantly going on. And every one of those thoughts or a lot of those thoughts are causing physical changes in the the visible face. And the the smiling is giving a feedback of positivity because, you know, I, I can't remember if we talked about this in the other last meeting. You did. 
yeah, you smile, it causes happy hormones to hit. And then that reinforces that sense of whatever you're thinking about is a happy thought. You scowl, you, you know, crease your brow, you, you have that <clears throat> sense of tension and, and struggle and sadness or anger. And all of that feeds back into those same very completely nebulous thoughts that by themselves have absolutely no no sense of tactile anything it's just an image of you know a bunny or something but but it gives it a sense of solidity because you can feel a physical response to it okay and, and that all makes sense and i can i can see all of that in my own direct experience the thing that seems to be missing is how does all of that get taken to be some sort of personal independent self yeah. i mean because right now i can tell you looking no such thing yeah. but without taking the time to look clearly that that experience will be interpreted just as you described it so you tell me what is the difference between when you are looking very clearly, like right now, you're looking super closely through your physical sensations, through the mental thoughts, and you're looking for the one who could possibly get up and perform an action, who could possibly want to open up, uh, want to stand up and open up the door, and who could willfully stand up and open a door. Mm -hmm. So can you find in any of those five internal or external senses anything which could be taken as the one who could perform that action? Can you say the five again? Yeah. So it's just your internal, well, your external taste, sense, uh, taste, smell, sight, hearing, and physical sensations. Oh, okay. And your internal versions of those, the, the mental versions of those. When you say the mental versions, what, what does that refer to? Yeah, so, so the mental version. So if you had like, uh, if you could think about a daisy right now, that's your internal sight field. And if you can hear a piece of music that's not playing right now or hear your own voice without speaking, that's your internal sound field. And if you can okay. uh, think of the smell of a hot, fresh baked apple pie, you know, that's your internal scent field. And if you can remember what it felt like to stub your toe, that's your internal sense field. And if you could um, think of what uh, a lemon tastes like, you know, when you bite into a fresh lemon, there's your internal taste field. I understand. And there's nothing in our experience ever that isn't one of those five internal or external things. Hey, right. Okay. And so where the question was, where, where does the self arise in relation to that? Yeah, where do where is there in any of those ten experiential experiential fields? In how in any of those do you have a sense that there is somebody who could stand up, who would want to stand up from the chair and open the door, and then who could physically do it and make it happen? It, it, the only thing I see that that would be an answer to that question is it's the thought and the belief that there is. There's, that's all I see. Good. And where, how is that thought showing up in which of the five mental internal sense fields is that showing up? Um, I guess it's showing up largely in the physical sense because the sounds they make provoke that contraction. And so, well, partly physical, partly thought, because there's the desire to stop what's causing the body to react to that. And then trying to do something about, you know, the thoughts, um, like, you know, he's going to chew on the door or that's annoying and the desire to put that to an end. So it's, it seems to be just physical and thought. Good. And are those thoughts, are those thoughts, uh, purely verbal or are you seeing like an image of you standing up and opening the door? Are you seeing an image of a chewed up door? If you don't do this, it's, it's largely, um, uh, verbal there, there's not a whole lot of mental picture going on with that i don't re i don't remember seeing any okay so here's what i want you to do i want you to actually go and open the door but before you do it i want you to be very aware of every part of your experience 
when it feels like you have made the decision to stand up, what it feels like to actually um, move your body in the way that you are walking to the door before you reach for the handle. I want you to experience how you know how to reach a hand out, how you know to grip the handle, how you know which way to turn it, how you know to move the arm to pull it back. Everything about the experience, I want you to be very aware of to see where in that is there any indication of somebody who knows how to do any of these things and who can control a, a physical body like you're driving a puppet suit. <laughs> uh, so so go ahead and do it but but be very very vigilant about the whole experience from now until the door is open okay well even in the beginning the decision happens but there's no one making a decision in fact i can't even see the decision Good. it's just now the body starts moving same again and keep uh, and turning the chair and there's not even really a decision it's just everything moves to turn the chair they stay in that space around it where you can see the sensations appearing you can see the thoughts appearing but you're recognizing that it's all happening in a sort of open space okay hmm. what else you can find in there is there anything that isn't just automatic physical sensation and automatic so far no I mean, again, the impulse, the, the intention to move and get up, it just happens. Amazing. There was not I who decided that. Same again with the arm. Arm moves towards the doorknob, and it, it's just doing it on its own. It's almost like a, a series of chain reactions. Yeah. You know, the first impulse leads to the next impulse leads to the next impulse. And, and before you open the door... Feel that urge to fully open the door now and feel what it feels like to really want to open the door. It's such a, ah, just got to do it. Feel that. <laughs> and feel where in the body. <laughs> Speaking of the, ah. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of that, that anticipation of like, you know, the nose got through there well before <laughs> the door was open enough. Okay. Ah, oh, so sweet. It really, it's 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 interesting to to be able to tell you that <clears throat> I never once actually saw a decision take place. You know, I mean, the assumption is that you decide to do something, so there must be a thought about it, something, some sort of mental activity around it. There wasn't a mental activity to to put any for any of those actions to to take place. It just simply it just simply was the sound happened that created an impulse the impulse it, it's like knocking down dominoes yeah you know yeah. and it reminds me i remember once uh, some years ago laying on the couch watching tv with my daughter and my hands were doing this and i realized i don't remember starting doing this I, I, the first thing i noticed was i became aware of the fact that i was doing this and then i sat there and watched it for a minute and i noticed I can't stop. <laughs> it, it's just happening. There's there's not an impulse to stop doing this. There's not an intention. There's just it's happening. Well, that's strange. And so I just sat there and watched it for a while. And then finally, the intention to stop doing this showed up and then it stopped. Isn't it incredible? Yeah. And so I, I would have to say this is in the same same category as I maybe mean, they're, they're both they both function or operate the, the same way. Yeah, absolutely they do. Just right now, I mean, even the gesture of doing this or the, the, the fixing your glasses or the reaching down, could you sense in any of that, any sense of pre-thought pre of, well, now I must fix my glasses. Oh, now I'm going to gesture with my hand because this will be make more sense. He will understand better if I gesture with my hand. You know, None of that is happening, right? It's no. too fast. It's too automatic. I, I'm talking with my hands all the time. And if I had to think about what I was doing with my hands, it would just be a complete. It would it would slow you down. You wouldn't be able to speak. <laughs> no, no. I have a hard enough time speaking as it is. If you if you held my hands down and it made me think about moving, it would just never happen. Um, yeah. 
But here's here's the kicker. There is still some sort of sense, and I don't know if it's just longstanding habit or what it is. There is still some sort of sense that there's some sort of entity or agent that is uh, bringing these things about. In what I, know, well, I can see it in my own experience. That's not the case. Like, so how does that continue to get bought? How does that idea continue to get who, who or how is that being bought into or, you know, I, I don't even it's <sighs> bringing, them, bringing them about in what way? What do, you, what do you mean by? Well, I mean, like I said, there aren't decisions being made. No, no. Uh, you know, something, some sort of external stimulus that gives rise to some sort of response from the mind-body complex. But um, there's still sort of this. Not really an idea. It's more a sense that somehow there must be some sort of responsible party. Is there a sense of a responsible party or a thought or a belief that there must be? I think you're, you're what you're saying is correct. I think it's a, 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 I think it's both. I think it's a thought, which is a belief. Yeah. 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 But it's nonverbal. So I think that's what gives it, that's what gives it the seeming substance. Is the fact that it's nonverbal. Somehow the nonverbalness of it seems to give it more solidity or reality or something, which is strange. You'd think it would be the opposite. Yeah. So so the question <clears throat> is, if it's not verbal, how is it being known? How is it being recognized? How is that belief functioning? That was a, that was a good question. question. I, I can't swear to this, but what it seems like is that it's something that has been going on for so long that just kind of a, an awareness of it seems to refer back to the thought, which is the belief, which is based in thought. If that makes sense. It does, but I think it's just not quite being picked apart enough. Because, okay. because for, for there to be a functional belief, there has to be some way in which it's being experienced. So we could say that, um, you know, if you have this belief in what you're good enough, it might come out as, as actual hearing yourself, putting yourself down in different ways. But you might also recognize it in terms of, um, you might have visual thoughts about all of the, the defects or all of the times that you have done something that you considered to be not, you know, wasn't, uh, you embarrassed yourself or you didn't live up to your standards or, you know, somebody shamed you in some way, you can have these visual uh, memories as well, or, and we can have these physical sensations that correspond to them. But um, the, the idea that there's a belief about a sense of self, like there's a belief that there's somebody there doing something I think what you're what you're getting at, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think everything that you feel as that belief could be broken down into physical sensations of the body, perhaps more subtle ones than you are conscious, you know, what the, you're, you're I'm sorry, at first aware of, and visual, possibly uh, images in the mind which are corresponding to it. And probably also some of those facial expression uh, sensations, and uh, you know, possibly also verbal thoughts. But a belief of that sort is generally just being reinforced by a combination of internal visual elements of, like visual elements of the body, visual you know pictures of the face of the of the torso of the whole body on its own feelings that like for me if i was going to you know bring up that kind of belief in a self i feel a lot in the back i feel a lot of it's like a sort of light kind of a 
you know, tingling-ish sensation sort of in the back, some contractions of, of you know, tension in the, in the chest and that, those areas, some tension in the face. And then again, those thoughts that are playing back and forth between the, uh, the physical body and, um, you know, this, the, also the, if I'm talking, there's a lot of it that comes through with the feeling of um, vibration in the throat and in the, in the, the mouth, the feeling of the tongue moving, <clears throat> all of that sort of thing. All of that is basically woven together in a way that creates this sense of there being something there that can speak and think and do something. And then that's why we do the inquiry to pull the thread have everything just fall apart into its components and then recognize that all of that, the whole belief that was tying that together was nothing but illusion also, you know, that a belief that you're not like, let me ask you this. If you aren't currently verbalizing it, how is a belief known? Well, in going to say it out loud, it, 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 it starts to sound kind of, kind of goofy, but <clears throat> it seems like there's, you know, there's a belief that's been there for, you know, as long as there's been a person here. Yeah. And so it's it seems like it's a sense of you know in other words it's understood there's a belief there yep. you don't actually have to think the belief you just know that it's there but then that in itself is a thought it is a thought but how do you even know like like i could right now have the belief that the earth is round but unless I verbalize it, I'm not aware that I even have that belief. If I'm not thinking about the earth being round right now, I don't recognize in this moment that there is a belief about the shape of the earth. I have to then invoke that, or that has to be invoked in some way. Yeah. And then a thought about it, which is in some way verbalized, because even if I see an image of the earth in my mind, that earth, the, the image that shows up is actually two dimensional. It, right. it might not be the, the flat earth that flat earthers talk about, but it's it's a, a two dimensional <laughs> image, right? Right. So even at that, it's still there. There is another thought that has to come in and say, "Yes, I have heard that the earth is round, and I have seen proof of why the earth is round, and you know, I believe that the earth is round." But actually, that without conjuring up all of that stuff. How do you know that you actually even have a belief? Good God. <laughs> um, it's surprising how difficult it is to answer that question. It doesn't seem like it should be difficult. Um, okay, well, good. It's nice to know it's not just some some sort of failing on the part of uh, this particular unit. Not at uh, all. It, it's more koan than it is answerable question. Okay, that's that helps. Good. good. Um, let it let it drop you into that realization that what is a what is a belief if it's not verbalized or conceptualized in a way some people aren't verbal thinkers some people are more uh visual thinkers well the the question that comes up is what is the sense there's sort of a sense of kind of an awareness of, well, I know that that idea is there. I can call it up. I can think about it. 
haven't done that. It's not actually happened. It's not, it's not been verbalized mentally or, or out loud. But it seems, that's what I'm going to say, it seems like there's a sense of it being there. Investigate that. Uh, get really curious about that, the, the, the depth of the reality of that. Well, the, the first problem, if, if that's what it is, is that even that sense of it seems to be thought-based. Ding, ding. <laughs> so, <laughs> huh. Well, it, it's something I'm, I'm going to need to spend some time looking at and, and, and really kind of digging into because um, there were, gosh, what was, there was a question you asked me about it. Um, and it wasn't just the, how do you know if there's a belief, if, if, if it's not verbalized. Was it the how? Oh, I know what it was. It was, it was about the, the combination of what's happening in the face, what's happening in the body, any mental imagery that might be going on, um, all of that um, being the more likely source of this sense of belief than an actual belief itself. Mm. That's, that's a new one. So that really seems like I, that, that seems to need some time to be, just, be looked into. Yeah. Yeah. Just investigate that in your experience and find out how is that belief being recognized? Cause you, you, you can't just say, I know I believe in, in aliens, right? You might, or you might not, but how are, do you know that you believe that? There has to be something that comes up for you to recognize that you even have a belief. Right. And then we look into, okay, so is it showing up because I hear myself saying, I believe in aliens? Is it because you have all of these, this rapid fire imagery of all of the uh, movies and documentaries and YouTube videos that you've watched that that compile all of this information for you to to prove to you. What does it? What is it to actually have a belief? You have a bunch of thoughts about something, but does that constitute a belief? Well, if belief doesn't exist as thought, I mean, outside of somebody acting on beliefs, which might be something else. Something a little different, yeah. Yeah, but um, if, if it doesn't exist in the form of thought, then, I mean, anything else I can think of, and it's, I'm glad you said something about it because that was really important. It, it, it will wind up, for me, it will wind up becoming something conceptual you know, like stored in neurons or something like that. So right. I'm staying away from that. I'm not right. going there good. because good. you can make an excellent point with all of that. Thank you. Because, I mean, we could debate about all of that, uh, you know, that that's, yeah. that's, yeah. So at any rate, so having said that, if, if a belief doesn't exist uh, in, in the form of thought, then I, I don't have any other way to, to explain it. Yeah, exactly. And so it is a type of thought, but I want you to be very specific about which kind of thought it is and how that thought is being experienced. Because you you don't, you like when you talk about it, you don't talk about it as though a belief is the specific thought saying, I believe in aliens. You make it sound like there's an undercurrent of just knowing that that's the case all the time without actually verbalizing it or thinking about it. You make it sound like the belief in a self is something which is tantamount to believing in, just knowing that you have a belief in aliens all the time, even if you don't talk about it. You just said it really well. You said it better than I feel like I've said it. Okay. So you, 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 you nailed it on the head. I mean, yeah, you, 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 you got it. That's right. Okay, so I want you to investigate, do you really have something that is an, a, a, a belief that is 
just under the current, bathing every moment in the feeling of being a self. Say or repeat that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try to make it a little bit clearer because that the first time it came out, it was not not the clearest. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, instead of assuming that there is something called a belief in self that is there underlying all the time, that's giving this feeling of just being a self uh, who is able to make things happen and do things and make choices. Instead of just taking that as the assumed case that it is, look to see if that really exists when you are not thinking that particular thought about it. Is it really an undercurrent that's always there? Or is it just there when you are creating a story about the fact that it feels like there is a self and putting words to it? Well, it's already starting to become clearer because when you were saying that, it it helped shine some light on the fact that it, it, it was happening as thought. I mean, it's weird because the, the thought was not really clearly formed, but I could see that there was a thought. The other thing is I also realized that it, I don't know how it happened exactly. I couldn't tell you, but listening to you, to listening to you talk about all of this, it, it made it clear at one point that there was a mental picture associating the idea of this, of this sort of undercurrent form of belief, but it wasn't seen as such because for, for instance, if you asked me to draw it, draw that mental picture, I couldn't, yeah. no. it was, it was very vague. It was, it was very unformed. Yeah. I mean, it was almost more, instead of a, a, a mental picture, the way you think of a mental picture, typically it was more, um, kind of like dark color with some hint of shape that was it yeah yeah which is weird because i i have never had i've you know when working with mental pictures you know I, like shinzen young does a lot yeah. with that yep. um yeah. it's always been and as a result assumed to be very clearly formed so that somebody said draw that mental picture you could draw it no, I, now I, something new has been learned that mental pictures can exist in really raw, very, very almost indiscernible ways. Yeah. Yeah. But, but whatever, whatever is recognizing it, which again is not you <laughs> still can make sense of it or use of it in a way in which it helps create this fabric of, of selfness, um, agency, um, right. Leadership. And it's just because it hasn't been looked at deeply enough and for long enough. Well, and, and some of this is new. Like I said, the, the idea of this mental picture is something that's so clear, unclear and vague. Yeah. Uh, it, it, prior to just now, I would have never guessed that that was the case. I, if somebody had said, so what are, what are mental pictures? I would have described something that was very clearly seen, very obvious, something that somebody said, draw it or paint it or even just describe it verbally that it could be done. So interesting to find out that's not always the case. Love that. Absolutely wow. love that. That's really interesting. So yeah. Huh. So good, man. <laughs> so I yeah, this this is something I'm gonna have to spend some time on. I'm gonna have to go back through the video and, and make yeah. some notes. And uh so Wow, but very fruitful. Yeah, yeah. This has been this has been really really good. Yeah, and then we, we need to thank the dogs for their help. <laughs> I know. See, I, I I do apologize to the dogs though for causing any distress to them for not going back into the room. I, I, I I've already I, forgotten I, it. <laughs> I know. I know. It's true. I genuinely felt bad about that though. I was actually torn. Like, oh, this feels wrong. But but well, it was I'm, a really good moment. I'm glad you feel that way. But at the same time, you know having a, an entire lifetime from my earliest earliest memories of always having dogs around I, what I can, one thing I can tell you is they're the ultimate now animal so true so you know true. I mean not that they don't remember things they do oh, you know if you're oh, yeah, time, you know especially but, if you know it's something that's done frequently they they're going to remember you know hey that watch out for that one oh, but uh, 
uh, at the same time, you know, something can happen, and as soon as it's over, they're done. The treats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then when it's over, it's like they didn't get one. It's like, where's yeah. the treat? I didn't get it. It's like, completely. You didn't even taste that. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, they're they're delightful creatures. Yeah. Oh, so they're yeah. okay. Yeah, well, uh, Godfrey's probably pretty unhappy because he's still out in the hall. He came back. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a constant stream of them just either wanting to come in or wanting to go out. There's, which, again, <sighs> a perfect example for the way that we are with all of our desires because there is something uncomfortable mm -hmm. in their situation in here. It's got to be better out there. They <laughs> want it out there. Then, oh no, now I'm still uncomfortable. Now I, I think I'm better off in the room. Now I want to get in the room. It's exactly what we do all the <laughs> fucking time. <laughs> We're constantly yeah. unsatisfied and striving to deflect it for and distract from it all the time. You're right. That's a great mirror for the fact that we're always chasing something to satisfy that that urge or that itch. And then we get it and then it's that particular urge is addressed, but then more dissatisfaction shows up. Absolutely. Because it didn't it didn't have anything to do with the thing that we that we thought we wanted. It's all about distracting from something that's under there and it has nothing to do with what we think is the object of our desire. They didn't really want to wow. get into the room. They wanted to get away from whatever they were feeling in the other room. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's, I, that, that's, that's something that uh, I need to remember that. <laughs> I need to really try to keep that <laughs> in mind as much as possible. At least, you know, one of those things that you remember under certain conditions. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause it doesn't matter whether, whether you, you know, I mean, obviously I know you've been sober since 2004, but it's like for people, it, it doesn't really matter whether the, the thing that they turn to is alcohol or porn or netflix or food there's people get addictions to all sorts of things but it has nothing to do with the actual object that they've become addicted to or that they are using to try to stop feeling what they're feeling it has all to do with that thing that they're running away from i i, I can attest to that because i drank to get away from anxiety and um we had we'd moved from texas where we had lived all of our lives then we moved to georgia and i was in this place i never lived anywhere else yeah. here i am living in this strange place and we don't know anybody so there's this anxiety there's this foreignness and a lot of other things and i was just uncomfortable almost all of the time and so that's what drove it i wasn't trying to all i was trying to do is get away from that uncomfortable feeling yeah absolutely as yeah. as are the dogs Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. So that's and, why, we, huh? So that's why we come back to the uncomfortable feeling because that's really what we're, what our work is is to just keep coming back to being with the discomfort, the discomfort that seems to be propelling us in all these different directions. All we need to do is just come back and be with that and see what it really needs, and and that's hmm. where all of the healing comes from to where. You then don't need to be constantly distracting in whatever um, uh, deflection of choice you know you have had at the moment, right? <clears throat> um, and for as long as this goes on, the dogs are probably I'm I'm almost I'm as close to certain as I can be. I, I don't want to state it as absolute, just because. It, but odds are they're going to be a constant theme through all of this. <laughs> That's awesome. Because I can't come back here and do this without somebody wanting in or somebody wanting out. Completely. Yep. It's perfect. It's really perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we can use everything. Yeah. Yep. Well, and the, the dog series. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Daryl and the Wheel of Identification and the dogs. Right. <laughs> Who apparently aren't. Well, I don't know. Maybe they are identifying. I don't know. I wonder. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. It's a probably really, in their own way yeah it's very possible that there's you know some some dogs seem a tad neurotic it's very it's very possible that they uh oh yeah there's some selfing going on yeah we got a lot of we, we we've got a, a fair number of shelter dogs and shelter dogs always i've never experienced it otherwise they always come with with issues yeah they, they always have something they're carrying with them and uh 
Yeah, so you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Poor things, but <clears throat> yeah. Well, they're here now. I know. I love you for doing that. And uh and I love you for doing this. Thank you so much again for being so open and willing to delve into these things and being so brave to, you know, tackle anything that comes up. And it's just it's amazing. So I I really genuinely thank you for for doing this. I think it's well, gonna be so good for people. Well, and again, the feeling is it goes both ways because I'm I'm really very grateful for the fact that you asked me to do this. So, I mean, it's what an opportunity. Um, and uh, you know, as far as being brave or anything like that, it's really it's just a testament to uh, what happens when somebody is driven very intensely to get away from discomfort, stress, you know, yeah. suffering in general. So. I get it. But in this case, you're doing it in a, you know, really, um, really selfless and beneficial way that I think is hopefully going to going to really help a lot of people. So, Well, I hope so, too. I, I really do. You know, I mean, if if even just a, a very few people get something meaningful out of this, then, you know, it, it, it's it, it served its purpose. I so appreciate that. I really do. Oh, and I really do. I, I hope that that you know there's somebody or somebodies who see this or see any of these, and um, it, it makes a difference for them. That'd be fantastic. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. So, <clears throat> thank you okay. so very much, man. Yeah, much yeah, appreciated. Glad to be part of it. Thank you. All right. Have a great night, and I'll uh, talk to you soon. Yeah, talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.